Hello and welcome back to this lecture series on post-colonial literature. Now, uh, we had ended our uh, previous lecture by discussing Rabindranath Tagore's and Franz Fanon's criticism of the idea, though we had also discussed how a uh, nation state had become the norm by the second half of the 20th century in uh, the parts of the world which was once colonized by the European powers, which means that independence movements in places like Africa, for instance, or in the Indian subcontinent, almost automatically led to the formation of nation state. Now, uh, but in the conclusion, I had suggested that uh, the criticism of Tagore and Fanon of nation and nationalism also compels us to look beyond the present political norm of nation states. Now, nation state is almost a political norm in the world, right? But as we have seen that there are very powerful critics of this idea of nation state and nationalism and these critics like Tagore and Fanon uh, compels us to look beyond the category of nation state and we will make this attempt today by exploring the works of Homi Bhabha and uh, see if we can arrive at an alternative understanding of post-colonial human community beyond the category of nation state. Now, our starting point in this exploration uh, today will be the concept of hybridity, which plays a central role in Bhabha's uh, work. And after we discuss uh, hybridity, we will then move on to another very important concept in Bhabha, which is uh, mimicry. And then finally, we will revisit the idea of nation and nationalism. But before we start discussing the writings of Bhabha, let me introduce uh, to you Homi Bhabha in a few words. Bhabha was born in 1949 uh, in the Parsi community of Bombay and he did his graduation uh, from the University of uh, Bombay before moving to uh, the University of Oxford as a postgraduate student. And there he completed his master's as well as his doctorate. He started his teaching career in the United Kingdom, but then moved on to America. And he is now the Anne F. Rodenberg Chair Professor in Humanities in the University of Harvard. Now, Bhabha is often regarded as part of the quote-unquote holy trinity in the field of post-colonial studies with the other two figure uh, being um, Edward Said and uh, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak. We have already discussed Edward Said in our previous lectures and we will take up uh, Gayatri uh, Spivak in uh, the lectures that follows. Um, but Coming back to Bhabha, his most influential work of post-colonial theory is uh, the collection of essays titled The Location of Culture, which was originally published in 1994. And uh, though Bhabha has subsequently authored a number of other important uh, works like The Black Savant and the Dark Princes, On Global Memory and Beyond Photography, he is primarily known for the location of culture. And in today's lecture, we will be exclusively focusing on this particular collection of essays to understand the theoretical position that Bhabha takes. Now, in our earlier discussion on the colonial discourse, we have seen how colonialism is constructed by the Europeans as a civilizing mission in which a superior culture of the metropolitan West comes in contact with the quote unquote inferior culture of the colonized periphery. This superior inferior binary uh, indicates that in spite of the colonial contact, the culture and civilization of the Western colonizer and of the colonized East were perceived as two distinct and separate entities. 
And this perception is perhaps most clearly stated in uh, that famous opening line of uh, Rudyard Kipling's poem, The Ballad of East and West. I have already quoted this uh, line in one of my earlier lectures, but I am going to quote it again now. The line is, of course, East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. Uh, and as I said, this line is perhaps the best expression of the notion that in spite of the colonial contact, the Western civilization and Western culture of the colonizer was distinct and superior to the culture and civilizational values of the colonized East. Now, this notion of distinct cultural essences separating the colonizer and the colonized also informs the kind of middle class nationalist discourse that we have studied earlier from within the context of India. Indeed, the cyclical pattern of fall and recovery, which should be very familiar to you by now. Uh, which underlines uh, the nationalist discourse is pivoted on the notion of distinctive and pure cultural identities. As we have seen earlier, the lament of someone like uh, M. K. Gandhi, for instance, is that India under the colonial influence has lost its distinctive culture and its native inhabitants are busy imitating the culture of the colonizers, which is completely alien to them. In the cyclical pattern underlying the uh, Gandhian nationalist discourse, therefore, the notion of return and recovery, which is crucial as you will know, signifies a reverting back to the civilizational values of a pre-colonial past, which represents an era of cultural purity. Now, against this idea of a pure culture, which can be distinguished and kept separated from another foreign culture and which can be reverted back to. Against this, Bhava proposes the idea of cultural hybridity. Now, since Bhava's concept of hybridity is complex and at the same time it is central to the field of post-colonial studies, uh, let us go through it carefully, step by step. Now, in order to understand Bhabha's theory of cultural hybridity, we need to understand um, that for Bhabha, culture is not a static entity. For him, it is not an essence that can be fixed in time and space. On the contrary, culture for Bhabha is something which is fluid, something which is perpetually in motion. It is a melting pot of several disparate elements which are regularly being added and which are regularly transforming our cultural identities. So, for Bhava, there is, for instance, no pure Indianness or Africanness or Britishness uh, that can be grasped, studied, or even returned to. And to understand what I mean here, let us consider, uh, for example, the famous European anthropologist Bronislaw Malinowski, who travelled in the early 20th century to the islands of Papua New Guinea to study the natives in their quote unquote original settings. Now, Malinowski's uh, writings on these uh, natives represent them as the possessor of a distinct culture, which has remained uncontaminated by any foreign influence. And if we look at this picture of Malinowski sitting with Papuan islanders, uh, it is easy to believe both in the pure uncontaminated nature of their aboriginal culture and the distinction separating them from the culture of the white man who is sitting between them. But as we know, Bhava would contend that such a notion of pure uncontaminated culture is a myth. All culture is characterized by a mixedness, which Bhava refers to by the word hybridity. But how can the culture of these quote unquote remote 
Papuan Islanders be contaminated in any way? Well, another modern day anthropologist, uh, James Clifford, in his essay, uh, Travelling Cultures, takes up this case of Malinowski. And he writes that Malinowski's portrayal of the Papuan culture as pure, static, unchanging, and uncontaminated is an illusion. And such illusions about pure, uncontaminated cultures are carefully constructed not only by Malinowski, but almost by all anthropologists writing about their field studies on dwellers of spaces far removed from the West. And the illusion is created, uh, for instance, by stressing on the isolation of the field which the anthropologist goes to study. This, for instance, is done by leaving away details about how the Western anthropologist himself or herself travels to that distant location. Because a detailed account of the travel will immediately destroy the notion of isolation and cultural uncontaminatedness. Why? Because it will connect the anthropological field with the metropolitan centre. Because at the end of the day, the anthropologist himself or herself, the Western anthropologist himself or herself is travelling and by travelling is actually connecting the metropolitan centre to that distant location which is removed from the West. Now, in other words, if the anthropologist managed to find his or her way to the field of study, then that field of study cannot but be connected to other places. And consequently, its culture cannot but be influenced by and mixed with other cultures, which is very obvious because if someone can travel into a particular space, it means that travel is possible. And the moment travel is possible, then we conceive that space not as an isolated area, but as an area which is interconnected with other places. And not only in terms of uh, physical interconnectedness, but also in terms of cultural interconnectedness. So, the notion of cultural isolation and uncontaminated cultural purity crumbles down here. If we think of how the anthropologist has physically travelled to that distant location, which is his or her field. But the notion of cultural isolation and cultural purity also crumbles if we remember that the anthropologist is communicating with the inhabitants of his or her field of study in some way or the other, which means that there is definitely some sort of translation going on. And it is through this process of translation that the anthropologist understands the culture of the native inhabitants about which he or she writes and also vice versa. The natives also understand the questions of the anthropologists, for instance. So, if a culture is all sealed up and isolated, then the very possibility of such a translation and communication has to be ruled out. But since such a translation is actually taking place in that field, we cannot really regard that cultural landscape as completely isolated and sealed. So, as Malinowski's case suggests, no culture is isolated enough to maintain any sort of purity or uncontaminated essence that remains static over time. The alternative to this idea of a static culture that Bhava suggests is that of culture as an ever unfolding process. Rather than being characterized by an unchangeable essence, it is characterized by change, it is characterized by flux and it is characterized by transformation. And most importantly, it is underlined by a sense of mixedness or interconnectedness which Bhava terms hybridity. So, how does this notion of cultural hybridity impact our understanding of the post-colonial condition? Let us consider the British colonial subjugation of India, for instance. 
Now, if as Baba suggests, cultures are dynamic processes characterized by change, flux and hybridity, then the binary of a superior culture of the British colonizer and an inferior culture of the subjugated Indians immediately break down. To talk about superior Britishness or inferior Indianness would mean talking about static, unchangeable cultural essences. But as we have seen in our discussion of cultural hybridity, culture is not about such fixed essences, but it is about ever-changing and ever-transforming processes. However, the colonial discourse cannot admit this because the notion of a superior and exalted Britishness is at the core of its justification of colonialism as a civilizing mission. The moment it is pointed out that there is no inherent essence of British culture, the illusion of the civilizing mission disappears and colonialism is revealed just as it is, which is an exploitation of other people's land and resources through brute force. The justification, the cultural justification breaks down if we point out that there is no inherent notion of Britishness or Indianness. So, of course, there cannot be any inherent notion of a superior culture and an inferior culture. Indeed, it is interesting to note that much of what the colonizer projected as the superiority of their cultural identity, including the superiority that they ascribed to their white skin color, emerged only gradually during the first decades of the 19th century. In fact, during the 18th century, for instance, the European colonizers had a much more uh, fluid sense of cultural identity and their approach to India was not marked by a belief in the binary of superior Britishness and inferior Indianness. Uh, so, for instance, as Ashish Nondi points out in his book, The Intimate Enemy, uh, before uh, the 1830s, roughly the 1830s, we can see most British colonizers in India uh, living life just like other Indian inhabitants and often marrying Indian wives and even offering uh, pujas to Indian gods and goddesses. So, as you can see, the British colonizers did not bring with them any ready-made idea of British superiority or exalted Britishness. Such an illusion of a static cultural essence only developed later to provide a justification for the material exploitation that colonialism involved. Consequently, the idea of a static Indianness which is inferior to the Britishness of the colonizer was also a construction of this same colonial process. Now, here I would like to introduce you to another uh, important concept in Bhabha, which is uh, the concept of mimicry. Now, according to Bhabha, the attempt to stabilize the cultural flux and hybridity that characterize the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized and to structure it in terms of a superior Britishness and an inferior Indianness led to a very interesting consequence. As I have uh, said, the construction of this idea of a superior Britishness or Western culture was crucial in defining colon col colonialism sorry, as a civilizing mission. And the logic of this civilizing mission was to culturally educate the subjugated natives so that they could attain the same level of civilization as the colonizers. Right? So, to repeat, civilizing mission which justified colonialism was underlined by the logic that because the subjugated Indians are now exposed to the superior culture of the British colonizers, they would ultimately learn from the British colonizers and would be elevated to that same level of civilizational superiority. So, in other words, the civilizing mission was about making the colonized 
more and more like the colonizer. And this project is most clearly stated in the 1835 minutes uh, that Macaulay wrote. I have already referred to this minutes in one of my earlier lectures. And here Macaulay states in this minutes that um, the colonial government should spend more on English education in India so as to, and I quote, create a class of persons, Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. Now, the problem with this effort to create a class of colonized people who are exactly like the colonizer is that if the project is ever to succeed, then it will erase the assumed cultural gap between the superior colonizer and the inferior colonized and thereby undermine the entire colonial process, entire colonial rule. So, if the colonized subjugated Indians were ever to become exactly like the British, then there will not be any notion of cultural gap, civilizational gap separating the colonizer and the colonized, which in turn will destroy the logic that colonialism is required to civilize the uh, people of India. Right. So, according to Bhava, though the colonizer wants the colonized to mimic him, to imitate him, he never really expects the latter to catch up. So, the mimic men of the colonial periphery are therefore, from the perspective of the colonizer, people who forever remain not quite not white and this is Baba's uh, term not quite not white. So, they are almost like the British, but never really like the British, right? And that never really like the British. Uh, that caveat is important to maintain the assumed cultural gap between a superior colonizer and an inferior colonizer because if the gap completely closes down, then of course, the justification of the civilizing mission ends at that very point. But Bhava points out that this very idea of a lesser human being, of course, the colonizer considered us Indians to be lesser human beings, but this very idea of a lesser human being mimicking the superior colonizer also turns the act into a sort of mockery of the superior colonizer's culture. And in order to understand this mockery, uh, you can imagine uh, the situation when a jester or a clown uh, picks up the manners of a suave gentleman and uh, then repeats it after him in an exaggerated and comic manner, right. So, it is imitation, it is mimicry, but it is not something that can be desired and accepted by the person who is being imitated because it is also a mockery of that person, right. So, this possibility of comically undermining the colonizer and his superior civilizational position through a partial repetition. This is what Baba refers to as the menace of mimicry. But now, let us again return to the notion of cultural hybridity and see how it impacts the concept of nation state. Now, I think it has already become clear uh, to you that a notion of culture as changeable and dynamic process characterized by hybridity of various elements is fundamentally inimical to the idea of nationalism and to the uh, socio-political construct of nation state. Why? Because the idea of nation is ultimately defined by a cultural essence which is unique to the people who are resident within its political boundaries and which has remained unchanged for ages and will continue to remain so in the future, right. So, what makes us Indians within uh, this uh, nationalist logic is our Indianness, which is a cultural essence, unchangeable cultural essence that uh, 
we share with everyone living within the political boundary of India and that has remained unchanged from uh, the glorious days of the past and has been forwarded to us which we will forward unchanged to the future generations. So this notion of Indianness as connecting us both with all the people living at the present and with the past generations and the future generations who are to live within this um, territorially, uh, politically defined um, territory is at the heart of the idea of nation. Now, but therefore with nation, we are back again to the problematic idea of static cultural essences. But, and because we have uh, extensively dealt with the problem that underlines and undermines this notion of static cultural essences, I will not go into them. But you see, Baba's notion of culture, therefore, is untenable with the idea of nation state. But more importantly, if we are to do without static cultural essences and think through the lens of cultural hybridity, then what kind of social organization other than the nation state can we conceive? Well, the answer is perhaps best given by Salman Rushdie in his uh, celebrated essay uh, titled Imaginary Homelands, where he urges us to look at ourselves not as grounded in any particular national culture, but as displaced beings who are living the life of an exile. The world around us is seeing an ever-growing number of humans being displaced, uh, humans moving from one place to another because of various reasons, because of war, because of natural calamities, because of political persecution, because of economic aspirations and so on and so forth. And uh, so the condition of being in exile is gradually becoming more and more common. But according to Rushdie, even if we are not physically displaced. All of us are displaced in time from the glorious national past that we might want to go back to. So for Rushdi, every one of us, we are all exiles, we are all displaced, if not spatially, then at least temporally. And in most cases, both physically and temporally. So such a mode of thinking the problem is that it robs us of our national identities that we have been taught to cherish since childhood. But Rushdie argues that there is a rich compensation and this compensation lies in the fact that we then as exiles and as displaced human beings become an heir to all cultures of the world and we can fashion our own cultural identity by mixing the disparate elements that the world as a whole offer to us. Our cultural identity then becomes a dynamic process of transformation and gives us far more agency to shape ourselves than is offered by the straitjacket of national identity. So with Baba's notion of cultural hybridity, we gradually move from nationalism and nation states to the idea of cosmopolitanism. And we will discuss this in more details when we take up the poetry of Derek Walcott in our next lecture. Thank you.